What we're doing the last couple of weeks is we're letting various people share their stories. And today I've asked my mother if she would share hers. And uh, this will be a different perspective, but it'll be an important perspective. Because there are many people out there who are from Christian background. And they wind up with a loved one coming out Amen. as LGBT. And that creates a conflict for them. And a lot of times it creates uh, grief in their family. And all of a sudden there's conflict in the family. And, you know, all kinds of issues. And uh, we want this support fellowship also to provide information and help to people who are in that position. So the, the Come Out Believing Support Fellowship, and if you look at our website even, it specifically says, this is not strictly for LGBT people. It is for LGBT related issues. But it is for those also that love them, that support them, that are related to them, that are supportive of them. And so tonight I've asked my mother, I'm going to have her come up in a minute and share uh, her story and uh, her perspective on this issue. Uh, I came out in 1989. And just to lay a little groundwork. Now, the way that I came out... Uh, I went back home to Connecticut after that experience I had. Now, I'm going to share my story in one of these meetings, too. Not tonight. But I'll share it at another time. But when I came out, I finally just decided I can't play this game anymore. I cannot live miserably. I cannot live depressed. I cannot live uh, suicidal and in such a horrible frame of mind. My whole life up until that point, that's all I knew. And serving God was a struggle from the minute I got up till the minute I went to bed. And, you know, when I'd have a minute of victory, I'd be praying, God, kill me so I can make heaven because I don't know what I might do tomorrow. Yes, amen. And I'm going to tell you, it's a miserable way to live your life. Amen. And I'm going to tell you something else. That is not how God wants you to live your life. Amen. God does not expect you. To live a miserable, depressed, Amen. condemned, guilt-filled life. That is not the plan of God for you. When you understand how grace works, when you understand Amen. the love of God, when you understand the truth of Scripture, then you'll understand that is not God's plan for you. So anyway, I went back up home to Connecticut after being here in Texas for a number of years. And I decided I'm just not going to play this anymore. I can't do this anymore. Because no matter how hard you try to do the right thing, boy, I'll tell you, the church will jump on you in a half Amen. a second. And they, Amen. honey, they will butcher you and throw you out for the birds to eat. That's right. Amen. At the slightest hint, especially of the LGBT issue, right. which is what really cracks me up. Because the church is so focused on that issue. And yet, their focus is never to reach out in love and to reach out in mercy and to reach out in a constructive manner. No, their, their, their uh, response is always condemnatory and nasty. And you know, I was part of one of the biggest mega churches in Texas at that time. Jesus Name Church. And that pastor turned on me like a snake. Didn't want anything to do with me. Didn't want nothing. Nothing. Mm -hmm. and, and mind you, at that point in my life, I had never, ever pursued a uh, being gay. Yeah. But all based on some literature that somebody found oh, yeah. amongst my possessions. Oh, all of a sudden, they knew all about me. They knew everything I was yeah. doing. They didn't know nothing. Amen. Well, anyway, I got so tired of it. I said, Lord, I can't do this anymore. I just can't do it. And I went back to Connecticut. And I began to go out. And I said, I'm going to be true to myself. I'm going to be who I am. Well, of course, the only way I knew to do that was in a secular environment. Right. So I began to go to gay establishments and meet gay people. And boy, I'll tell you, everything that I was told, everything I thought was wrong. That's right. Amen. Uh, everything I'd heard preached in churches was wrong. 
But anyway, I did not come out to my family as many people do, where they just come out and say, Mom, Dad, I have to tell you something. That conversation never took place, even up till this day. What I did was, uh, Paige, I decided, I'm just going to live who I am, I'm going to be who I am, and if my family sees it, then fine. Because I'm not going to hide it. Right, amen. So I just began to live openly and outwardly, if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, obviously it didn't take too long before everybody in the family was seeing this. And, you know, they're seeing me with gay friends, and they're seeing me hanging out with certain gay people, and, you know, this sort of thing. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm getting this, uh, CJ, you know, we noticed your ass at y'all, and... And you have a problem with that? You know, my grandmother told me once, said, Honey, you're always welcome in our home, but uh, I really, I don't really want any of your little toy boys or your little sex toys coming into our house with you. And I said, Really? I said, Gee, I've got uncles who are whoremongers. I'm going to talk plain. Right. I've got uncles who are whoremongers. I've got aunts who are sluts. They can bring boyfriend after boyfriend after boyfriend home or girlfriend after girlfriend after girlfriend home and you know good and well that your son is sleeping with every one of them girls yep. that he's dragging through this place. That's right, amen. And you don't one time tell him that his friends and his girlfriends aren't welcome. I said, well, Grandma, the minute my friends aren't welcome, I'm not welcome. I won't be back either if those are the rules. And my grandmother honestly said this to me, and I appreciate this. She said, then let's just forget we even had this conversation. <laughs> wow. That's what she said. Because she didn't want me to stop coming. So I just can't. I wasn't trying to bring people to rub it in their face, but I was just, if I was out with Derek or I was out with somebody, and I said, gee, I need to go by my grandmother's house. You know, I'm, I'm not hiding somebody in the closet. Right. I said, no, you go with me, and that's all there is to it. So anyway, that is how I came out to my family. So obviously my mother probably, I've really never talked to her about it a whole lot. Maybe tonight I'm trying to lay a groundwork and this will help stir up some things. She probably was getting a bunch of calls. Uh -huh. Oh, i got to tell you, i got a feeling something's going on with CJ, you know. And uh, standing for Chuck Jr., you know. Yeah. And anyhow, but that's how I came out. And I never did have a flat-out conversation with anybody. And uh, I will share more of my story at a future date. But that just kind of gives you, that was in May of 1989 that I made that decision. That was one of the hardest decisions of my life. And in a way, I thank God for the reaction of the church. Because, brother, if the church hadn't reacted the way it did, I'd still be miserable. I'd still be depressed. I'd still be struggling. I'd still be suicidal. So, you know, sometimes, folks, we look at the way the church acts and the way people do, and boy, you can just have all the fits you want to have. Let me tell you something. It behooves us to look at the glass half full. Yes, yep. amen. Amen. It behooves us to look at things sometimes and see the hand of God in it. Amen. Amen. I'm going to tell you, old brother Kenneth Phillips did me a big favor mm -hmm. by responding the way he did. He set me free. Uh -huh. He literally opened, hallelujah, Amen. he opened the cage for me. Uh -huh. Amen. <laughs> And I don't care what any of these lying devils in the, quote, ex-gay ministry world want to tell you. Amen. I'm as happy as a pig in slop have been for many years. I've never been happier. My walk with God has never been better. Amen. It has never been stronger. It has Amen. never been more blessed. I've never experienced the favor of God like I've experienced the favor of God and the blessing of God like I today experience the blessing of God. Because when you learn to live openly and honestly with God and to rest in His grace, I'm going to tell you, it's a wonderful, wonderful walk. And uh, so I'm very, very happy with my life. 
So these lying devils out there want to tell you that gay people are miserable in there. Honey, I was all that when I was still trying to live my spirituality according to your rules. Once I learned better, I've been happy as a clam. Amen. So don't tell me that gay people are all miserable and depressed. Brother Jack, I don't know anybody in our church that fits that description. Amen. 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 All right. So tonight, my mother, Donna Thompson, is going to come, and she is going to share her uh, story, her testimony, and as part of that, she's going to talk about uh, her response and uh, just various aspects of dealing with a son who comes out at, you know, 24, 25 years old, and especially a preacher's son on top of everything else. All right, so just before I have her come, let's just open with a word of prayer. Master, we love you today, God, and we thank you for this meeting. We thank you, Lord, today that those of us in this room have come to a place of understanding and revelation. God, your mercy, your grace is sufficient for our every need. And Lord, we're so grateful today, God, for this church, and we're grateful, Lord, for the truths that you allow us to preach, which bring liberty and help and health and healing to your people. Master, tonight, in the name of Jesus, we ask, Lord, that you would bless this meeting. Bless every word that's spoken, Lord, for those today... Uh, who may not be themselves part of the LGBT community, but they have loved ones who are, and they're struggling with the conflict of this issue. We pray, Lord, that my mother's testimony will be a help to them and an encouragement to them. Lord, let them know they can love their loved one, and you can bring great and positive and good things out of this situation that they might not ever have experienced were it not for things being what they are. You work in all things. Master, let everything we say and do tonight bless your name and lift you up and glorify you for that is our purpose, that is our goal, that is our desire. We ask it today and none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Mom, if you'll come at this time. Try to turn the mic down a little oh. bit, I guess. <laughs> there you go. Okay, I'm going to try to do this without walking all over myself. And I'm dressed like this because I have to go to work tonight after church. Uh, I'll tell you how Charles came out to me. I was visiting with the, the person I was married to at the time, visiting... Uh, were you in Connecticut or New yes, York? Oh, you were in Connecticut when we saw you. Yeah. And... Uh, somehow the topic came up and uh, something about gay and uh, Charles just looked at me because I was assuming, you know, I really didn't know yet. And he said, oh, mother, no. And he just said it. And I thought, okay. Uh, my heart dropped in a sense because I was so afraid of what was happened to him. Not for myself, but I know what the church does, I uh -huh. know what family does, yeah. and I was, I had been worried about him anyway, because he was struggling so hard, and there were those attempts, you know, and it was heartbreaking, it was really hard to go through when you see someone you love having such a hard time, yeah. and yet I believed him to be one of the smartest and best people I knew, very sensitive, I mean, I knew the potential and then uh anyway that was when <laughs> when he came out to me so to speak but i have to think back after charles asked me if i would speak uh i began thinking about it and i thought back to when i was a child and i had asked the lord i you know to take my heart because i was told in a sunday school or children's church class that at Christmas time, God gave us his son Jesus, and what he wants from us is our hearts. And I knew if I gave him my heart, I'd die. Uh -huh. I mean, we need our hearts to live. But the Spirit of God draws us, and it doesn't matter how old you are. Right. I knew I loved him. Mm -hmm. I knew I loved him dearly. I could feel it. And I said, Jesus, 
I know I can give you my heart, and you can take it, and you'll let me live. Right. And from that point on, like, he must have laughed out loud, but from that point on, I can see where he did have his hand on my mind, on my thinking. Uh -huh. Growing up was so very difficult for us when we were kids, my siblings, my sisters especially, I think, because we were the five, uh, the first five kids born to that ten kid family were all girls. So I, it was very difficult, and yet, looking back, hindsight having 2020 vision, I can see where the Lord had his hand on my thinking. Because right. I grew up in a time when there was an awful lot of racial unrest. Mm -hmm. And the Lord kept his hand on my thinking concerning that. And then as the church decided to get on to even the divorce issue, as you've mentioned, mm -hmm. I didn't see it the way the church did. Right. And then on the gay issue, I had heard that too. Now there's a, a, a topic where the church uses an awful lot of lying yes. and indoctrination. They sure do. And yeah. yet, when I read the scriptures they talked about, especially the Sodom and Gomorrah and all this, and it didn't make sense to me. It didn't, it just didn't ring true. I couldn't figure there was something that was out of line right. with what they were saying <clears throat> and what I read in the Bible. Right. And then, of course, uh, I worked for Uniroyal when I was young, when the boys were about you know, three and four years old. They were quite young. And I met some gay people. One was a woman who looked at me the way the men did, and she scared the gizzard out of me. <laughs> <laughs> but it turned out I liked her. And I and my boys would go to the mall with her shopping. We'd yeah. you know, spend yeah. some time. Of course, I kept my kids with me. And, and with everything the church uh, purported, I simply told her, well, I don't believe in that, uh -huh. being the fact that she was a lesbian. I don't believe in it. That seems so stupid when I think of it now. But I liked her. Right. There was a young black male who worked there. His name was Maurice. He was gay. And that child, that young man, was such a sweet kid. And I would think to myself, how can these Christians hate these people? They're just people. Right. Right. And they're wonderful. I, I liked Mary Alice Seals, and I loved that young man. I mean, I had such a great working relationship with them and could talk to them, and I couldn't understand why the church was so vitriolic, so hateful. Right, right. And like I said, though, now moving on up to present day or when Charles was an adult and he came out, even my family judges me. Yes. Because I am yes. his mother. My baby sister, who knows all, she can't know the mind of her sister, let alone God. And yet, I believe it's she who came out with, Donna will believe anything. She has no clue that since I was about seven years old, the Lord has been controlling or leading me into the right thinking. So I right. didn't have a personal problem with my son coming out. But I was afraid of, of the persecution. I was so afraid of what would happen to him. Yeah. And, but nobody knew, nobody in my family even ever asked, well, have you prayed about it? Right. Of course I did. This was my son. I love this, this young man to death. He's my son. And when he came out, I said, Lord God, please, is he going to split hell wide open? But this is what this church says. This is what they say. Right, right. Now the Lord, like I've heard others testify, that he doesn't give us these long, lengthy explanations. Uh -huh. He simply said to me, that is mine. Not he is mine. I already knew the Lord had called Charles at eight years old to, to preach. So he didn't have to say that. What he told me, the issue, was his. Right, right. And then after that, it was simply thrown into my mind, you keep doing what you've always done. Right. You keep loving people. You keep accepting right. people. You keep right. being the way I'm teaching you to be. Right. It's not that I haven't had struggles. I have. Uh, growing up in a very um, uh, dysfunctional family, and then <laughs> marrying a very dysfunctional moron. <laughs> 
and then having these three beautiful sons, it was hard. It was really difficult on all of us. Yeah. Um, but the Lord had his hand on me since the time I was very young. And even in my own situation where I was uh, coming out of a very abusive childhood and went into a very abusive marriage, um, I realized years later when I moved to Texas to when I got rid of that, you know, I wanted to get away from all that abuse. And I moved to Texas and then not too long later I actually got into law enforcement and became a police officer. And it was the teachings in that we had to continue taking as police officers, you know. Uh, we have to take these courses occasionally every year, you know, you've got to keep up so many hours and a lot of the teaching uh, about the abuse and being in an abusive relationship made me see how the Lord actually extracted me from that because yeah. that's not something women can do. Yeah. A lot of times when they leave an abusive situation, it takes them at least seven tries to finally get out of it. That's the average. Yeah, yeah. Seven tries to get out of it. And it has to be planned. Where the Lord, of course I got into my 30s, and you know what happens, a woman in her 30s, her testosterone kicks up, so I became more aggressive. And here I thought it was me. I thought, oh wow, look at this, I am really getting up there. Yeah. And then I read in the newspaper where, yes, you know, as a woman gets in her 30s and her testosterone kicks up, she becomes a little more aggressive, and I thought, shucks, I thought it was me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was so proud of that. Uh -huh. But I realized that uh, from all the battering, from the 20 years, because I was married to his dad for 20 years, and all that battering, that man should have had me down to nothing. And he did. You know, I had gotten to the point where I couldn't stand myself. Yeah. So all of how does this all relate to um, the gay issue? It's Jesus. Yeah. If there's a Christian out there who claims they love the Lord and he lives in your heart, you will not and cannot hate gay people. That's right. right. And you cannot persecute them. He doesn't. When I meet people, I love them. I, and I thought I was crazy when I would keep saying, well, I love this group or I love that person. And a man I worked with, a fellow police officer, just said to me one day, well, Donna, you just love everybody. And I realized how ridiculous I sounded. And I thought, Lord, you know, I do sound ridiculous. I know it, it isn't humanly possible. And that's when another time he said, that's my love you're feeling. Yeah. And I realized it and I said, oh, my God. Now it makes sense, because uh -huh. I knew that all by myself I couldn't. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, I know, I know he loves this group. I love my church. Yeah. I love Man, the people yes. that are here. We, you know, people who've been put through the mill the way this group has, that when they do come in here and they're so happy to find a place, they're so easy to love. Yeah. They're such a great bunch of people. Not that there aren't some goofballs that are gay, but it's just yeah. that... It's not, you can't take an entire group of people and put them all in, in one situation. Yes. That's just not the way it is. That's right, that's right. You know, everybody, heterosexual and homosexual, are individuals. And I just thank God that from a very early age, he had his hand on my thinking. As a child, I'll never forget one morning when I woke up, I don't know what I was thinking about, except that all of a sudden I heard this question. Who made you white? Oh, you did, God. Well, who made you an American? Well, you did, God. I wasn't born in another country. Right. I wasn't born a different race, but that wasn't my choice. Right. He made me who I was to be proud of who I am in Him. Yeah. He right. made black, white, yellow, red, which represents, you know, the different races, uh, right. so to speak. Every one of them has a right to be who they are. That's right. right. And that is what, at a young age, he was teaching me. Right. And when I lived in Oak Lawn for a while, the predominantly gay part of uh, Dallas, I had some of the best neighbors I could ever have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I loved it. People talk to you. Yeah. And invite you to have barbecue with them. You know, and in a heterosexual situation, you don't find that so much. 
unless there's some fool man who wants to jump on your bones or something. Yeah. You know, God help me, that's a terrible way to say it, I suppose. But um, yeah, I felt safer there. Yeah. You know, and I I don't know what else to say. My experience with the gay community has been a very positive one. Yeah. And I know if people would would just let God be God in their lives, if they seriously love Him and seriously want to serve the Lord, right. talk to Him. You ask Him. I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. Questions? You know, a lot of times part of the, the struggle with people who come out dealing with their families is, is of course, the family reaction. Yeah. So did you find that you had to, I guess, suffer, if you will, a lot of criticisms? Did you have a lot of people Only in your family? Or, from my family. I mean, but can you kind of talk, I mean, is it okay. you kind of talk about? Or? Oh, yes, I did. As a matter of fact, I, I had a friend, his name is Tom Lancaster. Mm -hmm. And he was, uh, he worked at Penzant County Jail with me for a while, and he's very negative as far as the, the gay issue goes. And I remember trying to explain to him how, you know, the messages that Charles preached, you know, you can be gay and Christian. You, you do not live a decadent lifestyle. Right. And Tom just laughed at me and said, oh, oh being gay and not acting, and I wanted... I wanted to knock him out is what I wanted to do. He was saying this in front of everybody, and I wasn't talking to him in front of everybody. Right. Mm -hmm. And I thought, his ignorance really got me. Mm -hmm. And his ignorance always gets me. Tom mm -hmm. means well, but when you choose to remain ignorant yeah. instead of asking the Lord, you know, that's it, I think. I and One thing I never did either was announce, well, my son is gay and blah, blah, blah. I just never did that. I just feel if people see and, and they get that, okay. But uh, I just never threw it out there like I wanted to be controversial. I will speak up if I see something and somebody's making the comment and I'll, I know better. You know, I know that that's not the way they are. That's yeah. baloney. You know, uh, I will speak up that way. How about when you always have people <coughs> who they just feel it's their obligation to help you mm -hmm. see things, quote, right? Yeah. Like family members and right. others. And it's like they find out you have a gay son and you're supportive of him. And it's like, but boy, they've got to help you understand this issue mm -hmm. right. Do you, do you experience a lot of that or have you experienced that? Not that I can think of at the moment. Um, you know, so much of what I respond with is things I've heard from this pulpit yeah. and the, the uh, scriptures. And understanding them now, uh, the way they were meant to be understood. For instance, our Bible studies from Romans, yeah. where Paul had written to the Christians in Rome. Right. And these were the Romans who wanted to serve the Lord, and, and there was so much decadence there, right, right. and the way things were done, you know. And here the Western world takes it, applies it the way they want to use it. Right. And I find that if you have somebody that's so dogmatic in their belief, they don't even want to hear. No. I don't bother, because I'm not yeah. going to throw my pearl before the swamp. That's right. Yeah. I'll let the Lord take care of them. Yeah. But I'll tell you. Listening to the messages here, uh, not only does it help um, as far as understanding scripture, but it does boost faith. Yes. Because I'm telling you, I, I pray for the unsaved loved ones right. of those of us represented here. Right. And I just know the Lord has it. Sometimes yeah. when I try yeah. to pray, I just start saying, thank you, Jesus, yeah. for the answers. Yeah. Because nothing is too hard for you. That's right. That's right. You That's know, right. He, he is... Um, an awesome God. Yeah, he's, you know, he is. Ooh, I'm, <laughs> Charles, I just think he stands up here. The Lord <laughs> does. I'm feeling it. You, know? <laughs> you have a question? Yeah. Uh -huh. What did his dad and his brothers think of him? His brothers love him, and they do not have an issue with it. They love Tommy. Yeah. Okay. What about his dad? His dad is an idiot. I don't know what he thinks because I I would have to be demented to understand how he thinks. Uh, he doesn't like anybody. 
He doesn't like anything. Yeah. He yeah, and, and just, the yeah. abuse he came from. He didn't have the Lord help him through his the way Jesus helped me. Yeah. Because I depended on the Lord. Right. He has become a sociopath. Yeah. Nothing's his fault. It's everybody else's. And if he were to talk to you, he would be telling you what everybody else has done. But in truth, those are the things he's done. But that's called projecting. He projects it onto everybody else. Like, you know, Chuck, Chuck did this and that to me. When in fact, he was the one who did it to Charles. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I know that obviously in the present, Mm -hmm. or, or current time frames. Mm -hmm. Obviously the Lord has helped you continue to grow and yes. just sinking and everything, but if you go back like to the very, very earliest times, you know, if you are comfortable and, and you mm -hmm. think of your honest initial early reactions, mm -hmm. for you personally, did you feel like any kind of, you know, like you were at fault for you know, Charles' situation, or did you feel any guilt, or did you struggle emotionally with, you know? Yes, because of different things that I would hear, because I did not hate gay people, I thought that it was caused by abuse. And <laughs> Charles would get so aggravated. <laughs> he couldn't be nice about it. Oh, no, come on, mother, that is not the reason. <laughs> and I, oh, go, geez, okay, I stand, stand corrected. But, and then later on, as uh, you know, he was in the ministry, he would send emails from people who had written about their gay children or gay people who had written about their experiences. And my heart would just break when I saw, because this, this was what helped me to grow. My earliest reaction yeah. was, like I said, my heart dropped, yeah. not because it changed how I felt about my son, it didn't. I was afraid of what he was going to have to endure, and and that is what got me. I just didn't want to see him persecuted, and knowing, you know, how my mother was, uh, my mother was strange, and I ended up not communicating with her for a long, long time, because I couldn't seem to say anything, but she had an excuse. Or there was always something negative she would say, so I just kept away from it. This was my way of trying to protect my poor sensitive skin from pain, yeah. you know, because uh, there's a, a lot of stuff you go through causes a lot of pain that doesn't go away, as you all well know. Yeah. Uh, it's just something you deal with every day. And, you know, it's, it's uh, I don't know what else to say here. Right. There, there are a lot of negative stereotypes that we know, anybody in the LGBT community knows, yeah. are a bunch of malarkey right. that a lot of preachers mm -hmm. have been peddling for right. decades. The gay agenda. Yeah, and you know the idea that gay people are more likely to abuse children oh. and to be sexual predators and all that. Now I know in the process of your courses with the law enforcement yep. that uh, they offer a lot of information in those yes, areas. Can you share some of that? Yes, and I, I had forgotten all about that. But as we were studying on sexual abuse and sexual assaults, uh, it was said in this course for police that the men who assault young boys are not, most of the time, they are not homosexuals. Right. They are straight men who simply do this for their own gratification. Right. And it, uh, and even the case of uh, sexual assault on a lesbian was so much more difficult for her. And it said, when you deal with a lesbian who has been raped by a man, you have got to be very sensitive. Right. You have got to be very careful because that is so unnatural right. to her. That's right. That that invasion is horrible. <laughs> That's right. And I could only imagine, you know, but it is. It, the, it cited um, numbers that I can't recall right now, but I do have the course materials at home. Um, but that was the truth, that's right. The percentage of gay people who do any kind of thing like that is very small, you know, in the whole scope of things. It's right. generally like 85% straight guys, right. you know, and you have a few perverts perverted gay people, yeah. <laughs> not yeah. as many He's as straight people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.
-hmm. Well, you know, they a lot of these preachers have been, and organizations have been mm -hmm. trying to say for decades, you yeah. know, that proportionately, yeah. uh, gay people are far more inclined, you know, don't leave a gay man around your little boys because he'll want to bless your little boy, mm -hmm. you know. And yet, statistically, all kinds of studies and things have been done mm -hmm. that show that the numbers are absolutely not at all out of line with the number of gay people in society, period. Right. In other words, if in fact 10% or 15% of society is gay, mm -hmm. you're not, you don't have more than 10 or 15% right. of the offenders in sexual issues who are also gay. Now, I'm so, going to have to look that stuff up in my uh, materials. Course, yeah. Because I think the percentage in the gay community would be even less than yeah. the proportionate with the straight. I'm yeah. not sure, but uh, when they when they did that study and they asked all these perpetrators and everything, well, they're not gay, you yeah. know, but they just do that because I, they're demented. It's, it, they're, well, sexual sexual crimes are an issue of violence and control. Right. It doesn't have anything to do even with gratification. So these Sometimes, men, yeah. you know, these mm -hmm. men are just trying to control and manipulate. And sometimes there's a greater uh, payoff in their mm -hmm. mind, anyway, mm -hmm. when they're able to control and manipulate a boy yeah. over a girl, oh, because boy. girls are actually viewed as being more easily mm -hmm. manipulated mm -hmm. and controlled. Mm -hmm. So if you're able to get over on a boy, mm -hmm. then. They, you know, and so that's part of the issue. I, you know, I know I've done some studies on these issues as well. Yeah. But they talk about, you know, uh, sexual crimes are violent crime. Yes, they are. Period. I mean, that, that's the category they fall into. Any yeah. sort of sexual crime is automatically classified as a violent crime. Yeah. And so there, there's, a, there's a violence motivation in Mm -hmm. You know, and I know for me personally, power what, and control basically yeah. is, are the two top things. Now, yeah. the gratification, there is some of that in there, and that's also done mostly by heterosexual right. men. It doesn't matter who they molest. Well, I remember but, when mm -hmm. I first came out and I began to go to gay establishments, mm -hmm. I never saw bar fights. Mm -hmm. I never saw bar Well, every once in a while, some of the more bulldog ladies would <laughs> <laughs> kind of oh, get no, aggravated no. with each other. Oh, but no. honestly, you know, you could stand there, you could be flirting with somebody else's partner, mm -hmm. and they might say, um, excuse me, he's taken. Mm -hmm. But that was it. You didn't mm -hmm. see it go into a brawl. Yeah. Then, years later, I go with my brother, who's more heterosexual than any heterosexual, <laughs> and we go into straight, this one, I was still out of church, and he wants to go to strip bars and he wants to, you know, and he's visiting New York. Yeah, we go in, I go into these straight clubs with him and stuff. You don't go in one single time without seeing a fight. You don't go in one single time without seeing violence break out. I would be standing there looking as dumb and disinterested as any human being could look. And some guy would come over and want to pick a fight with me because I'm looking at his girlfriend. And I'd look at him and say, buddy, you have no idea how disinterested in your girlfriend I am. <laughs> but it's so funny how gay people, mm -hmm. they try to paint the gay community as being far more violent, being far more destructive, mm -hmm. being far more aggressive. And when you look at Romans 1, that's why I said about Romans 1, that list you read in Romans 1 does not describe gay people. Amen. Any person who knows anything about gay people knows that that list in Romans 1 does not describe gay people. Right. You know, and so anyway, I mean, I know... The purported propaganda. Oh, they have. You know, they've been the propaganda. I'm just so glad, though, that the Lord kept his hand on my thinking and yeah. delivered me from uh, a difficult childhood and then a, yeah. a very difficult uh, marriage, marriage for 20 yeah. years, you know. Uh, I'm just grateful, yeah. you know, and I'm so glad that God is God. Yeah. Any other questions before I? Okay, good. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> she bows before the queen. <laughs> Hello! <laughs> that was cute. Uh, I appreciate that, and I know, I know that that will help 
a lot of uh, non-GLBT people, but they have LGBT people in their lives. And, uh, you know, I can tell you, uh, seriously, you know, I've said it before, and I will share my story. I've done it before, but I'm going to do it again as part of the Come Out Believing series because we have a website specifically devoted to these meetings. And we put all the videos from these meetings on that specific website. So I'm going to share my story one time. Uh, and uh, I'll share more details. But I will tell you, as I've told you many times before, when I first came out, I was so afraid. I wanted to meet somebody. I didn't want to have sex. When I came out, uh, let me tell you, Having sex was not on the agenda. A relationship was on the agenda. Uh -huh. That's what I was looking for. And, uh, but I didn't know where to go to meet anybody. I didn't have any clue how, you know, this is before the internet was what it is today. And, you know. And so I began to go to, you know, gay establishments. There was this one nightclub in Connecticut that I went to, and it was a marvelous place. I, I, I hate to tell you, but as far as nightclubs go, it was a wonderful uh, wonderland of uh, entertainment. They had a, a jazz bar over here, and they had a disco over here, and they had a pool, uh, another room with pool tables, and a, a video uh, jukebox, and I mean, it was a cool place, you know, and I used to go there and loved it. So many things happened early in my experience of coming out that completely blew out of the water things that I had been told and taught my entire life. Amen. Amen. Lesbians are men haters. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. They'll look at you, they'll kill you as soon as look at you, because lesbians just hate men. Baloney. Amen. Baloney. When I first came out, without fail, the first I don't know how many people I met and befriended and we'd get together and hang out and we would do things. We're a bunch of women. Yeah. And I had, I had at least two or three of them that said to me within the first year or two of my coming out, Charles, if I were straight, honey, and if you were straight, boy, you'd be the fella I'd want because yeah. I just love you. you know. Yeah. And to this day, mm -hmm. now it's been... 89 to 2014, folks. Mm -hmm. 25 years. I have met thousands upon thousands upon thousands of gay lesbian people. Amen. And I'm going to tell you something. I have met a few men haters mm -hmm. in the lesbian community. And I'm going to tell you, those that I have met have good reason. Amen. Amen. I mean, these are sometimes women who are raped yep. as young girls by members of their own family right. and, you know, things like this. Amen. It's not a healthy response and it really needs to be worked through. Yes. Amen. But it's understandable. Amen. Okay. But I, I, when I first came out, I had these older men who at the nightclubs, you know, where I frequented, you know, they took me under their wing. They looked out for me. Mm -hmm. They made sure, Charles, you don't want to get involved with that person over there because he does drugs and mm -hmm. you don't want to bring that into your life, you know. And they would look out for me and never one time, not one time, did any of these people make a pass at me, touch me, do anything to me. That was the least bit out of place, Brother Jack, not one time. And I remember the first few years that I had come out, I was so conflicted because I could not for the life of me understand how that I had been told all my life that gay people are so perverse. Right. That they're hiding in the shadows, wanting to convert your children to homosexuality. That is so stupid. What would I gain by converting, you know, a child uh, to Amen. becoming homosexual? Amen. What is in that for anybody? Amen. But this is part of the absolute asinine propaganda, like Amen. Mom said, that the church has been peddling. 
There's a, a ministry that's been around for many, many, many years. They produce tracts and they produce what look like comic books that tell various testimonies and stories. They have a lot of very good material on certain subjects. They do a lot of good stuff when it comes to some of the cults, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnessism, um, Catholicism. But then they go the extra mile and they've got their little comic books and they've got their little comic strip looking tracks that demonize the gay community like you've never seen. And you should see. I, I'm going to have to get some of their stuff so I can show it to you. You should see the way they portray gay people in the drawings. Yeah. I mean, they literally portray gay people hiding in the shadows, looking for children, and they have these wicked grins on their face like, God forgive me, but I believe hell is going to burn hot. Yeah, amen. My Bible says, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Amen. So far as I know, that's in the top ten. Amen, that's right. Yep. I'm going to tell you, if you think you can just get up and, and propagate all this propaganda mm -hmm. against people, and you think that God is going to justify you in this, whether what you're saying is factual or not, mm -hmm. simply because you've convinced yourself that ultimately on this issue you're right. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've got news for you, honey. Guess again. That's right. Guess again. Any more than God is going to let the sinner or the unbeliever slide Amen. who misrepresents the church Amen. and tells lies about the church and tells lies about Christians. God is no more going to let that slide than He's going to let you slide right. with your lies about LGBT people. Amen. And most preachers I know from personal experience, I've been in ministry for a very long time, I know a lot of preachers, have never, ever, ever really looked into or investigated the gay-lesbian issue at any level. 99%, especially in fundamentalist or evangelical circles, because there's that mindset in fundamentalist and, and evangelical circles. Oh, bless God, we already know the answer. That's right, amen. Uh -huh. We already know the answer. We've been preaching the answer for years and years and hundreds of years. Why do we need to look into this issue when we already know the answer? Now, like I said Sunday, I believe, or Tuesday night, I was actually so pleased I was able to use that uh, analogy because... I, when it happened, I was kind of wondering if I was going to be able to use it. Here I am sitting on my bed. I've got my little table, oh, my little TV yeah. stand next to me, and I've got my mouse, you know. All of a sudden, I, I hear something drop. Well, see, when I'm tired and I'm using my laptop, sometimes I'll put the mouse over off the table and drop it. Oh. <laughs> I didn't realize I had done that. I heard something drop. Immediately, my mind leaped. And I said, oh, I dropped the remote control from the television because I set it on the table. I said, the remote control dropped. Well, I don't like to leave it on the floor because after a few minutes, I'm 48 years old, I forget. <laughs> and then I'll be looking high and low for it, forgetting a few minutes ago it dropped on the floor. So if it drops, I immediately have to get it, you know, put it back on the table. So I get down on my hands and knees and I'm looking under the bed. And there's not a whole lot of anything under the bed. I've got this little sliding thing that you store stuff in, you know, that slides, it's on wheels and slides. That's all that's really under the bed. And I'm looking there, I cannot for the life of me see that remote control. So finally, after a few minutes, I stand up and I, I said, well, doggone it, where could that remote control have gone? And I'm looking over here, I'm looking over there. It went, could it have bounced over here? Could it have you know gone under the nightstand? I mean, I, brother, I'm looking like a lunatic for the remote control. Finally, after ten minutes, 
of searching for the remote control. I look at the TV tape stand, you know, the, the TV table mm -hmm. tray, and there sits the remote control. <laughs> now see, I jumped to a conclusion. Right. I thought I knew the answer before I'd even looked into the matter to begin with. That's right. And I was looking for what I thought was what was what had fallen. Mm -hmm. Well, I finally realized, well, there sits a remote control, so it couldn't have been the remote control. So now I'm looking at some, well, what's missing? And I said, oh, the mouse. <laughs> I did one of those things where I started nodding off and I knocked the mouse off on the and when it fell it you know jarred me awake that happens every once in a while so I get back down on my hands and knees and there's the mouse just as big as life <laughs> it was there 10 15 minutes ago too yeah. but because I was looking for the remote control I overlooked the mouse. That's right. Amen. That mouse, honest to God, may as well have been invisible to me. I'm going to tell you something fundamentalist. I'm going to tell you something Pentecostal. I'm going to tell you something apostolic. I'm going to tell you something evangelical. When you think you already know the answer, yep. mm -hmm. you will never find the truth. That's right. Amen. That's right. Amen. That's right. Amen. You will never find the truth. Amen. Because you'll be so busy looking for what you think yep. the answer is. And everything you read and everything you look at, you're going to see what you want to see. That's right. Because Amen. you're only looking for information that will support your belief. Mm -hmm. That's true. Amen. And when it comes to the gay lesbian issue, that has been the mindset of the church for hundreds of years. We know the answer. You see, you've got to remember, this goes back to antiquity. Look at David and Jonathan. Look That's at right, Saul's man. attitude about David and Jonathan's That's relationship. Right, it's perverse. That's right. That's right. He said that. You've got to remember, in antiquity, most of your ancient religions were all built on the whole concept of reproduction. Right. Ancient civilizations were so obsessed uh -huh. with the abilities of human beings to procreate mm -hmm. that anything that veered away from that norm was considered just horrible, disgusting, and vile. Isn't it funny? We got people in the Christian church today who are every bit as obsessed uh -huh. with human reproduction uh -huh. just like the old phallic religions right. of Amen. ancient times uh -huh. that anything that veers away from that in any way is just disgusting and horrible and vile and unnatural yeah. to Amen. them. Isn't it funny? For something that is so unnatural it can be found in hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of species of bird, yep, mammal, fish, insects, reptiles. Amen. Uh -huh. For something, brother, that's so unnatural. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I got news for you. If you want to be honest about it, nature. Mm -hmm. supports the notion of same-sex attraction. Right, amen. If you won't be truthful about it. Amen. Nature supports that. And, uh, and I don't think God is blind to it. I don't think the Bible speaks of it in the negative context that most churches and preachers try to set forth. Okay. To be honest with you, I think the Lord is in effect more silent on the issue. I think there are a lot of things God is silent on. That's right. And I think we make a huge mistake when we try to put words in God's mouth. Amen. And that is something that I grew up watching. I'm going to tell you, folks, I, you know, me, and I'm going to shut up in a minute, but <laughs> Mom was so short, I figured I'd fill in a little bit. I'm going to tell you, this boy, I grew up in church, and I'm like my mother. I didn't 
you know, my brother cracks me up because he, he's wanting, he's been through Iraq and he's been through some horrific things. And he's going through a time right now where he's trying to be real agnostic and, you know, anti-God and all this sort of thing. But, and he, you know, has suggested to me that, I just believe what I believe because that's what I was taught. And, you know, ever since I was a kid, I've been indoctrinating. And I have to laugh when I hear him say that because that boy don't know me at all. Amen. Amen. That boy don't know me at all. I got Amen. news for you, honey. You could, even when I was a kid, you could tell me something. If it didn't make sense, it didn't make sense. Amen. Amen. Uh -huh. That's right. I was just reading an article. Uh, not, excuse me, not an article. A man sent me a book in the mail dealing with uh, the Bible and sexual issues. That's his whole book, you know, it's about. Uh, and he comes from a very conservative background, and yet he's done a lot of research. And I mean, this man is very intellectual, very smart. He knows the original languages, the whole nine yards, and he breaks it down. And he said, folks, I got news for you. The way we look at gender and the way we look at sex mm -hmm. is not at all true to the way it's written in Scripture. That's right. Well, anyhow, I'm reading this book, and what cracks me up is he's talking about the Trinity. Mm -hmm. And he's explaining it, and he's saying, but of course, we believe the Trinity is a mystery that really can't be understood. Oh, geez. Because there are so many aspects of it that go beyond human logic and human reasoning. He said, for instance, you know, how can this be? And how can that be? How can the Bible say God is a spirit? And yet we know that the Bible speaks of the Spirit of Christ and the Bible speaks of the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Trinity and yet the Father is the Spirit. So how is it there's only one Spirit but, but you know, based on our understanding of the Holy Trinity, there are three persons and each of them are Spirit in nature and blah, 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 blah. And I sit there and I thought to myself, well, the answer is quite simple. There aren't three, there's one. Amen. And they're one and the same. Amen. And there are not three persons. There is one person right. of God. Amen. He is revealed to us in the man Jesus Christ. Yeah. And when you say Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, Spirit of Christ, Spirit of the Father, Spirit of the Son, you're talking about the one and self same Spirit. Yes, amen. Now, to me, it's pretty easy. But isn't it funny, this guy's so busy looking for the remote that he looks right over the mouse. Yes, amen. You follow what I'm saying? Yes, amen. The same thing is true in theological realms. The same thing is true in regard to LGBT issues. Folks, I hope there are some straight mothers and dads watching this tonight. Yes, amen. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. A lot of people who have had young people come out in their families and in their lives they finally feel motivated to really look into this issue seriously mm -hmm. and honestly. Mm -hmm. And without fail, they are shocked by what they discover. Mm -hmm. Because what they've been taught is not the truth. That's right. Mm -hmm. I had a young man visit our church. Oh, it's been, heavens, eight, nine, ten years ago now. We were still at uh, All Saints Episcopal. And this young man, I believe his name was Michael, visited our church. His father is a United Pentecostal pastor. When he came out to his father, the reaction, of course, was very negative and nasty. He said, but several months later, his father called him and said, Son, I have been doing some research because I do not want to react to you with lack of knowledge. I do not want to react to you without having spent any time looking into these issues. Amen. He said, I've been doing some research. He said, for instance, I began to look again at a lot of the biblical passages mm -hmm. like Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. He said, and what I have found has shocked me. He said, these things do not say what I've always been told they say. That's right. mm -hmm. 
There are so many glaring contradictions. Amen. You know, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Why in the world would Lot want to live in a predominantly homosexual city? Yeah. I'm gay and I wouldn't want to live in a predominantly homosexual city. Amen. Amen. Honestly, I, I, I would. There, there's no specific benefit in that for me. Why would I want? You know, why would I want to do that? That's absurd. Why would Lot want to live there? How could he have two daughters that have husbands? Right, amen. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. How come when they get out of the city, the first thought in his little perverted daughter's minds is, let's have sex with daddy. Yeah. So he can have offspring. Hello now. Uh -huh. I got news for you children. The, the perversion in Sodom didn't have jack squat to do with homosexuality. Amen. That's right. But there was perversion in some. That's right. Amen. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's a... And this father acknowledged to his son. And he said, based on what I've seen, we are just going to continue to love you. Amen. said, I may not understand this issue. And you know what, folks? You don't have to understand. Amen. Amen. You don't have to understand your kid to love your kid. That's right. That's right. That's right. I don't have, listen, I don't understand my parents half the time, but I still got to love them. I don't understand half the people in the church, and I still know how to love them. If you'll get out of that foolish mindset that somehow or another you're supposed to have a grasp on everything right. in order to be able to love and support people, no, you don't have to have a grasp on nothing. That's the wonderful thing about serving an all-knowing God. He's got a grasp on it. Uh -huh. He gets it. He understands it. Those things that confuse you and confound you, he has got a firm grip on. Amen. All right. So I appreciate Mom sharing her story tonight.